going to Charlie. Charlie was a very effective congressman. Uh, he got for his district what it needed, and that was in the days of collaboration between the parties on the hills. So he was a very good congressman. He, he did his job for his constituents and for the national interest, in which he was very strong about. Um, let me correct a few misconceptions. Uh, when you walked into Charlie's office on the hill, right behind the door was a receptionist. And then just a few feet over the desk was, was what seemed to be another receptionist. And one was a Miss Universe and one was a Miss World. And I don't remember which was which, but if you were a naive like me, you walked in, you just stood there with your jaw hanging open. Uh, they really were gorgeous women. And uh, they, they worked for Charlie, so I presume they earned their pay as receptionists and whatnot. But it was a popular place for other congressmen to congregate. Charlie's office for <laughs> obvious scenic reasons. Um, and uh, they were very polite, seemed very competent when you came in. Charlie was a bit of a flamboyant fellow. Uh, the first thing you noticed about him was that his necktie, his pocket square, and his braces always matched exactly. So he had them tailored. His suits were perfectly tailored. And uh, he always wore cowboy boots, of course, being from East Texas. Well, enough of that, but one story. Uh, it was when he left uh, Af Pakistan and wanted to go to India uh, that he uh, got a hold of the air attache and he had one of the women with him. I don't know which one it was, Miss World, Miss Universe. And uh, he wanted a flight in. Well, the Air, air Force attache said correctly uh, that you know, you, you can board certainly congressmen, but we can't take civilians aboard because it's against not only regulations, but the law. I mean, Congress has passed that law. So he became incensed at this. There was a, quite an altercation at the airfield, and finally he, uh, he was turned down, so he took a commercial plane. Uh, well, the two of them took a commercial plane. Uh, uh, the attache uh, was supported fully by the ambassador. The planes were there to move the ambassadors around in country, especially if the country was large or dangerous. Sometimes the planes had other functions too. But it was the air attache who was always the pilot of the aircraft. So he, the air attache had really multiple duties. Uh, sometimes overloaded. Well, anyway, Charlie threatened the air attache. He went to the ambassador, etc. No good. He came back, and since Charlie was the senior Democrat on the defense subcommittee of the House Appropriations Committee, what he did was he crossed out the entire well because the budget was <coughs> under DIA. Okay, so for all the aircraft around the world in all the embassies. So he crossed out the appropriation for all of the DIA aircraft. And DIA and defense had to fight that for almost a year. And we pleaded, not only with Charlie, but with the chairman of the committee and all that, uh, I mean, these airplanes had other functions and we were losing a lot. And and, and ambassadors were having to travel in really dangerous country. Uh, it took about nine months to sway the congressman, and finally Charlie withdrew his, uh, his hold on the money, uh, and swallowed his displeasure. I presume by that time the young lady had forgotten all about it anyhow. So that, that's one run-in I had with Charlie. Now, uh, I never knew Charlie. I tried to stay away from the hill, except when I was ordered to 
by the Secretary of Defense to go up and testify on sensitive intelligence topics before the intelligence committees, particularly if there was a pending covert action or there had to be a report on the progress of a covert action. And why me? Because I ran a special staff directly for the several secretaries of defense in the 80s. And one of my, um, I had several portfolios. Most of them were non-existent portfolios or unmentionable portfolios or completely deniable portfolios. So if you look for an official bi biography, um, I was listed as, I don't know, water carrier or something like that. Um, <clears throat> anyway, uh, one of my duties was uh, uh, providing all the support to CIA's covert action. Remember, this was before 9-11. These were the days when only CIA conducted covert action. Any other agency could support it under executive order. But it's since 9-11 that defense conducts covert action also. Um, and then I wrote all the policy papers for the secretary to take up to the NSC principals meetings with the president on these kinds of topics. So anyway, I was pretty familiar with them. Well, one day I was called in and I was told, go see this Congressman Wilson. And uh, so, of course, I, I called the, uh, the uh, well, it was a Near East Division then because of Pakistan, Afghanistan, out at the agency and asked what's what. And they said, yeah, there's a, stirring up some trouble, so go with him. Well, the first trip was with the Afghan task force chief in a senior moment, I can't remember his name. But the visits after that were with Gust Avrokotos. And Gust was one of the officers assigned to the, and a lot of people at the agency called him Gus. He resented that, it was Gust. Uh, he was a Greek American. He spoke absolutely fluent Greek and several other languages. He was a gifted linguist. He was also a first class street officer that was working uh, with uh, sources, very good, and he had gotten into some pretty tight places. And Goose definitely was not an Ivy League type. Uh, he, uh, he was a chain smoker. He, uh, he was very taciturn on business, um, but we established a very close and good relationship, and so we worked very closely. Anyway, Charlie. Charlie told us point blank he wanted to go out and kill communists. So I told him, well, I can't speak for the agency, but, but so do I. <laughs> and, 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 you know, and one of the things we're doing in Afghanistan, which, by the way, the program started back under uh, uh, President uh, Carter. Zbigniew Krzyzynski talked them into it after the Soviets invaded Afghanistan. And the program slowly built, of course. And this was, if I recall correctly, 1984. So we went in and saw Charlie after I closed my jaw, going in to see him after seeing the two girls out front. And uh, uh, Charlie told us what he wanted. And uh, he, he, he wanted to discuss the situation. How can we kill commies, more commies, faster? And that, that was the gist of it. He wanted ideas. Well, we had a couple conversations. We visited him a couple times. And then he made a trip to Europe, and I don't think it was sleeping with a girl. There was something about a contract, really, that was. But in that world, everything was like that. So. <laughs> Um, Charlie decided that uh, since the Soviet helicopter gunships were killing Mujahideen, I mean left and right, because of the terrain, that they needed some anti-air protection. Well, we were exploring that. We looked at British uh, man pads, 
uh, man portable missiles. Uh, we looked at French man pads. Uh, we even looked at the Soviet ones, uh, thinking of setting up a, our own production line because we had gotten hold of them. And, and you know, that those things were done. Uh, but none of them were satisfactory as far as accurate accuracy, uh, speed of tracking, uh, not being put off by uh, flares, uh, you know, defensive mechanisms, and mostly range and altitude and reliability. A lot of them would not take, uh, you know, being humped around the, the Hindu Kush by a bunch of illiterate uh, goat herders, in essence. So the, it, it had to be a pretty rugged weapon, and yet a very sophisticated one with very modern capabilities. Well, we eventually settled on the uh, Stingers. And I could tell you a story about all the problems there and the insubordination in, in the Pentagon. But anyway, that, that's another story. So uh, Charlie, after making this grand tour of Europe, came back and he announced to us that he thought that the CIA ought to provide the Mujahideen with Balfour's Erlikon anti-aircraft guns, which were very sophisticated modern weapons, had a computer on them like most modern artillery, all modern artillery has. And uh, uh, he said they were portable. And I reminded him they were not portable, they were transportable, but they were not portable. They weighed several tons. It took time to lay out all four tracks, elevate the, I'm not an artillerist, so I don't know the, the, tech, the, uh, the, the right terms, uh, but you had to elevate the platform uh, and then you could do the acquisition and shooting, et cetera. And you needed eventually a power supply. Well, if they weren't portable, I mean, a helicopter gunship could, could beat moving these things by mule anytime. Um, and they had to be broken down and moved on several mules or put into a back of a Toyota pickup. And you not, cannot believe how many tens of thousands of Toyota pickups the taxpayers have bought for various programs, literally. I mean, if, if, if Detroit had the contract, we wouldn't have had to bail them out. Uh, anyway. Charlie pressed and pressed on the early cons. And the CIA, and he threatened, of course, uh, go to his friends on the House Intelligence Committee and cut money and all that. And, uh, and in the end, not me, but speaking for defense, but CIA decided that, well, best thing to do is give him his toys. I mean, that, that's what will keep him quiet. Uh, whatever, you know, tens of millions of dollars it costs is cheap at half the price. Just get them off our backs. And uh, of course, never get Charlie off your back when it came to killing communists. So the early guns were bought, and of course it was the Air Force that transported them into Pakistan, and then the agency moved them uh, through the pass. Uh, the Khyber Pass, which is a very interesting place. I once had dinner with the uh, Khyber Guards, a very famous force going back to Kipling's time. Uh, fascinating place. Anyway, um, the, the guns and ammunition were delivered, and they were put into action, and they, they worked. Not as good as the man pads, but they worked. I don't know what happened to them eventually. Uh, to be frank, but uh, anyway, the uh, oh, as usual, since uh, the the budget cycle was a annual, 
and the agency, like every other agency in the federal government, submitted its budget to the president through OMB uh, in on February or March or April, sometime around then, and it was to be enacted in September in time for the one October date. Uh, since the um, fiscal year was already underway, of course, CIA said we have no money to pay for these arms. And uh, Charlie went to the subcommittee and they said, well, we can't appropriate for, for CIA, we can appropriate for defense. And uh, they were a little wary of that. So what happened was what usually happened always in these programs was that they came to defense. Defense had to pay for the CIA program. And uh, it was always a Solomonic decision. Okay? Air Force paid for one third, Army paid for one third, Navy paid for one third, and everybody screamed and was unhappy. The comptroller said the secretary said to do it. It's the president's order. And I was a man who delivered the message to the services each time. So, uh, so it was done. Believe me, that happened quite frequently. So anyway, that was the story of the triple A. Uh, let me mention two personal things. Uh, and we'll do this thing with some other time. That's a longer story. Uh, I haven't seen this film. I haven't been particularly anxious to see it. And I haven't read George Kreil's book, except it was brought to my attention. So I read about two pages of it. Uh, there's a quotation and they're ascribed to me. Uh, Goose, by the way, is dead. Uh, and uh, that, that quotation described me as completely false simply because I don't use language like that. So I sought legal advice and I went to someone I knew, a lawyer, who works for a very prominent big firm here in town, not far from here, uh, who uh, before had been general counsel of the CIA. So he knew all the ins and outs. And he counseled, he counseled me and said, well, the book is out. There's nothing you can do about it. He said, the, uh, the publisher will never apologize because that makes him liable under law. Uh, the, uh, they won't change the text. The most you can get without even a covering letter is an erratum slip submitted in following editions. Well, there wasn't another hardcover edition, so I never got any satisfaction from that, and the quotation is there for posterity. I just hope someday all the books are remaindered and ground up. Uh, <laughs> I don't want to be associated with that quotation or that kind of language. I, I think there are more effective ways of using your point. Anyway, uh, that's my personal note. Uh, I. As I said earlier, I agree with Charlie that we wanted to kill communists, kill them all. And we came up later in the uh, war uh, with a good scheme to do it. And it was beginning to work. And then, believe it or not, uh, the lawyers got into it just as we were about to take the final action and really uh, probably stopped most of the resupply by the Soviets. But that's another story. So maybe some other night. So thanks for having me. Thanks for your attention. If you have any questions, <laughs> if you have any questions before the film, uh, I mean, I'm not selected short subjects or cartoons, so I don't want to delay the film. But oh, the mules are simple, yeah. Uh, we, well, we, I mean, it was obvious the only way to get around uh, <coughs> Afghanistan was using mules. 
uh, in it besides the pickups. Uh, but it was mostly the, the mules. Well, the last time I looked, and this was about a quarter of the way through the program, we had already bought 50,000 mules. And I mean, some of them were shot up by uh, gunships. Some of them fell down the sides of mountains on, from the trails. I mean, they as sure-footed as they were, those trails were pretty bad. Uh, some of them just dropped from exhaustion, uh, and then they were eaten, uh, which was the best thing you could do with the mule afterwards. Uh, certainly varied the diet. Um, anyway, there were there were tens of thousands of mules were brought. Some of them were brought in by uh, by contract flights, but the Air Force flew a lot of them. And in, I mean, we Air Force must have flown at least 10, 15,000 mules in. And the loadmasters hated them. <laughs> they hated them. Because, of course, they had to clean out the, the floors of the C-130s. So, um, and there were other things were brought in were almost as bad. But uh, working with the Mujahideen was really something. L let me just add one real quick story because this is towards the end of the program. We wanted to make sure that the stingers were being used and going to the right parties. And we knew they were being warehoused under ISI supervision, but a warehouse with which each of the five uh, Mujahideen groups so I was sent out by the secretary to inspect the warehouses and literally inventory the uh, stingers and see who was getting them and what the instruction was like. For Well, the instruction was primitive, but it was extremely effective. The Mojadeen learned very fast on how to use stingers. Uh, the, the problem was dispersing some of this stuff over the mountains and the jealousy among the five groups arguing and whom ISI favored at a particular time. Unfortunately, two of the groups that ISI favored even early then uh, was Gubadin Hekmatyar's group, which is the group that tried to level Kabul and take over the government after we pulled out of the program. Completely selfish and Hakani group. Anyway, uh, and I went out and watched the training under a uh, ISI brigadier. And of course, I started out as a courtesy to, with the station chief, and we went to see the head of ISI, who at that time was a major general, uh, Hamid Kul. Um, if you didn't know it was Pakistan, you would think you were in the United Kingdom. He was a perfect British Major General. He had absolutely no trace of a Pakistani accent, none of the habits or traits of a Pakistani officer. His shoes were like mirrors. His uniform was stiffly pressed. I mean, he wore the bush jacket uniform. Uh, he was all turned out correctly. He had a guardsman's mustache that was perfect. I mean, he looked like he had stepped out of a movie. The man had a strategic grasp of what was going on in that world. When he briefed us, I just sat there in awe of his grasp, not the details of what was going on every day. He knew that too, because he was running ISI. But the big, long-range strategic picture and what everyone's interests were. Well, he retired. Today, former Major General Hamid Ghul is the chief military advisor to the LAT, the people who did the raid on Mumbai and would be willing to bring down the Pakistani government if they could. Same guy. Extremist. Same, same, guy. Guy. same guy. Same guy. Anyway, that, I'll, I'll finish this in about a minute. 
uh, I, it happened to be Ramadan when I was there. So since I was the guy providing the weapons, so to say, the money, I was invited to break the fast with the leaders of the five groups who were specially brought in uh, to uh, Peshawar. And uh, Gul wasn't there, but Brigadier Yusuf, the head trainer, was there. And uh, we had supper, he introduced us to him. And uh, two of us Americans, a CIA guy and I, sat on chairs on one side of the room. And, and by the way, the other, the, 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 they would have, the, the uh, Mujahideen would have nothing to do with us during the supper, nothing. I mean, they, if we went to a table, they moved to another one to pick up the food, etc. And the five sat across from us on chairs, and Yusuf translated. And we asked questions, and was silence. And Yusuf had to prod them into giving an answer. It doesn't matter what they said. But the, the hatred and that's all I can call it. hatred in the room was so palpable I could have cut it with a butter knife all they did was stare at the two of us and it was clear that all they wanted was our money and our arms and they were going to use them as they please which they did so anyway end of story it was hate 